Welcome to Ellen Parish Church this morning. My name is Alistair Bruce and I'm the minister here in Ellen Parish Church. If this is your first time uh, with us this morning, then you are most, most welcome. Um, we're glad that you've uh, taken the time out of your week and out of your day to join us. Um, if this is your millionth time, then you are equally as welcome here. We are in the series, uh, the season of the church year that we call Easter time. You might have thought that Easter had passed when you ate all of your chocolate eggs, but we are still in Easter. We're coming to the end of Easter time, and today is the Sunday that we call Ascension Day, Ascension Sunday. And uh, over the course of this, uh, this season, we have been exploring 
the stories of Scripture, the stories of the Bible, stories um, of Jesus through a theme that we've called storytellers. And, uh, and really the idea is, uh, is linking the experience of the disciples with our own experience in our everyday lives. So the, so the disciples had experienced something that, uh, that was unusual, and they went out and told people. And then we, as the followers of Jesus, now are, uh, are called to go out and tell other people that same story. This morning, we're going to be looking at and exploring an incident at the end of the disciples' journey with Jesus, um, where Jesus um, seems to leave them and, uh, and this is something that has been misunderstood over the centuries uh, by Christians and by uh, people. Might have led us to a slightly uh, wrong uh, understanding of one part of Scripture. And so we're hopefully going to bring that back into what it is that Scripture actually says this morning and hopefully give you a richer, more scriptural understanding of what is a fairly big Christian concept. And weirdly, it's got something to do with how we understand uh, uh, the uh, eating chocolate. So we'll come on to that later on. Our, our young folks are doing a, a little mini-series on kings, and so we've been going through the story of King, uh, King David, King Saul we started with, and then King David, um, and, uh, and they're going to hear about King David's great idea this morning. So, um, f- before we do all of that, let's take a little moment as we still our hearts to approach God in worship. Why are we looking up to heaven? Christ has come. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Why are we looking ahead into the future? The Holy Spirit is among us now. In our baptism, we have already died and risen with Christ. Why are we afraid of death and dying? God's love casts out all fear. Why are we afraid to follow Jesus. In Christ, we have the promise of new life now, eternal life to come. In Christ, we join our hearts to worship God who has prepared for us to enter the reign of God. So let's stand, if you're able, as we sing together our first hymn, which you'll find as number 157 in the purple hymn books in front of your seats or behind your seats if you're sitting at the front, um, or it should come up on the screen, uh, the screens behind me.
Just a couple of notices and a couple of intimations, a couple of uh, things that are going on to uh, tell you about, to remind you of. Um, one of the best ways that you can find out what's going on in Ellen Parish Church, if you're even a little bit technologically uh, minded, is to check out to the Ellen Parish Church website. We have a new bit on the website, so we've got a church, an Ellen Parish Church calendar that is on the What's On page in the website that will tell you all of the stuff that is happening uh, in Ellen Parish Church over the weeks and months and, and, uh, and everything to come. So if you go to the website and you look under the What's On page, then you should be able to uh, see all of the things that's going on uh, there. Uh, you'll notice that uh, just in, the, in, the, in, in, your, in your seats, in the front of your seats, there's a welcome card uh, that's there for you to say hello to us. Uh, if, uh, if you want somebody to contact you, if you want some prayer, uh, if you just want, uh, want to say I'm new and I'd love to have some more information about Ellen Parish Church, then fill that in um, and then stick it in the box, uh, the welcome box at the back, and then somebody from the church will, uh, will get back in touch with you um, uh, to find out what it is that you're, uh, that you're looking for or to pray for you, um, if that's what you've asked for. Um, you have the order of service, please take that away with you. That gives you the prayer points uh, for the week and also gives you a, an idea of what's going on uh, as, uh, during the week as well. Uh, I've been telling you a little bit over the last little while about, uh, about some new things that are coming up, some new activities, some new worship services. So Connect, uh, the worship service that existed before lockdown, is coming back once a month uh, starting next Sunday. So. Uh, generally, it'll be the last Sunday of the month, but we're going to try it for a couple of months and see how we get on with it. There's a poster with all of the information on, uh, on it at the back, but basically it's contemporary worship, uh, discussion, prayer, uh, teas and coffees, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, we'll start at half past six, we'll aim to finish by about eight o'clock. Um, so come along and try that if, uh, if that is of interest uh, to you. Uh, Nicola's going to tell us a little bit about uh, Christian Aid. Hello. Um, this week is Christian Aid Week, and instead of doing an extra coffee morning for it or that, we've, um, with same that we've done with a few charities, all the donations that's come in for the cafe and the shop over in the Kirk Centre this week will go to Christian Aid. So, so far, we've got just over £350 has come in from that for Christian Aid this week, which is great. Um, we've also got a basket at the back of the church. It's got a big, um, not that basket, it's okay. Uh, that's got a big leaflet in it that says Christian Aid for anyone who wants to give today. And if you're thinking, oh, but I don't have cash, that's fine. We've got a button on the card machine as well. <laughs> so Edith can sort that out with you in the Save a Loaf corner at the back too. I know, darling, I'm nearly done. And then the last thing was to say it was lovely to see an increase in donations of uh, food and goods for the larder this week. Um, where I'm not very good at getting the shopping list for it out to folks. So we've got it in the intimations now. Um, I'll be putting it up on the Facebook page regularly as well. Just to let you know, we've had uh, an influx in um, folks coming to the larder and uh, our own shopping bill for the larder. We do an ASDA delivery each week just to make sure that we've got the basis of what we need. Um, and in the shopping this week, a lot of the items went up by between 10 and 30 percent just in the last week. Um, and that was from Asda Peterhead. So I had done all of the, put all the shopping into the trolley and whatnot on the online delivery. And then I got a message through saying these essential items have gone up in price and most of them were up to 30 percent increase. So you can see why folks are starting to panic a bit. Um, but if everybody's given a little, then it really helps uh, to be able to make sure that folks have access to food locally. So we'll try and make sure and get the lists out. It's in the Bridge magazine of the things that we regularly run out of. Um, and as I say, in the intimations, and I'll do a better job of getting it on Facebook too. Thanks so much for your support though. Also a good reminder that the, the, the summer edition of the Bridge magazine just came out on Monday. And so there's some copies at the back uh, that you can look at as well. If you don't get the Bridge magazine, then fill in your welcome card and we'll put you on the mailing list uh, to then get you uh, the Bridge magazine. It's also available on our website. Uh, the Explore course is coming up. We've been telling you about that over the last few weeks. This is effectively a, a way of coming along to uh, um, learn a little bit about the church, about the origin story of the church, about what the church means and why the church exists. 
different, we're going to explore different denominations, we're going to explore uh, what Ellen Parish Church is, all of that kind of stuff. So for three weeks in June, we're going to do that. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet at the back for that, or you can speak to me about it at the end if you want to know more about that. The, uh, the choir meets on Thursday, and the life group uh, that meets on Thursday is also meeting on Thursday this week. I think that's all I need to tell you about. Um, uh, and we are going to pick up the offering. Yep, yep, okay. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's pray together. You've made your name known to us, Lord Jesus, through the stories we share and the life you offered, and we thank you. May we decide ourselves this day and every day to live as we are united to you and your purpose for the world. May we live to bring healing, reconciliation, and grace, to be peacemakers and justice seekers, speaking up for the oppressed and for those who have no voices. So may we commit to seeking our place in your kingdom, and may these gifts of money help us to do that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jillian's going to come up and tell our Bible story for this morning. So, today's story is about King David. Do you remember last week uh, David had just become king? Yeah? So it's a wee bit about him, how he's going to start being the king. And you can see I've got some rattly stuff behind me, which some of you are kind of congregating around. So we're going to need a bit of noise, and we're going to need a bit of dancing. Who's brought their dancing shoes with them? Perfect. You're you wearing your dancing shoes, because I am not the best dancer, so I'm going to need somebody else to do it for me. You do not want to see me dance. I promise you, it's not, not a good sight. Really not a good sight. So... King David's great idea. So King David had his own fine house in the city of Jerusalem. But one day he had a great idea. God ought to have a new house too. I will build God a beautiful temple. He couldn't wait to begin because he was so excited. But God said, no, one of your sons is going to build my temple. It's not you. So David was very disappointed, but God made a special promise to him. I will make you a great and a famous king, God said, and your family will be kings forever. God always keeps his promises. We do know that, so that's great. So David was a great and famous king, and he won many battles, and he kept his people safe. But he never stopped thinking about that temple for God. Do you know the way sometimes you get an idea in your head and it's hard to get it out? Yeah, I think that's what was happening with David. I think so. So King David thought of a plan. He couldn't build the temple, but he could get things ready. And that was a great idea. So he made himself a list. One will need stones, big stones. So they brought big stones piles of big stones to build God's temple. Two will need wood, the best wood. So they brought the best wood, stacks of beautiful cedar wood to build God's temple. Three will need iron, and four will need bronze. Five and six and seven will need gold and silver and jewels. So they brought mountains of iron and bronze, they bought chests full of gold and silver and jewels, all to build God's temple. I think that's everything, David said at last. Now for the people to do the work. And he made another list. One, we'll need people to look after God's temple. That's your job, he said to the family of Levi. Two, we'll need people to help us come to God. That's your job, he said to the priests. Now for the music. Can you see why I brought these up with me? <coughs> Waiting for it. So this will be fun. So we'll need harps to play the tunes, 
cymbals to make a loud noise, and the best singers that we can find for the choir. Okay? So David wrote some of his own special songs, psalms to sing in God's temple, and the choir made up new songs too. Praise God in his temple. Praise God with the trumpets. Tan, tan, tara. Praise God with harps. And praise God with drums and dancing. Boom, da, boom. Boom, da, boom. And praise God with loud cymbals. Praise God, everyone. My, yeah, I didn't find cymbals or drums, but if someone wants to get up and give me a bit of noise and a bit of dancing, that would be great. And what can we say? We could use that drum, but it's a bit far away. We can all go, praise God in his temple. Praise God with the drums and the cymbals. Praise God with the dancing. Anyone want to get some dancing going, Anna? Promise me. Oh, I think it's just a quiet one. That one's better. Cool. It's not working. Okay, just that, that, that one's much, much better. Cool. So now everything was ready, and David was very happy. So thank you, God, he said, for everything you give us. Oh, and when the time comes, please help my son Solomon to build your temple. So that was David's great idea. He was going to build the temple. And he was a bit disappointed because he wasn't going to get to make it himself, but he was being very organized and making lots of lists and thinking of all the things that we might need. Sound like a plan? Yeah, something that'll work. Very cool. If every story I've ever heard is right, mm -hmm. right God is going to tell him to send them all away and, and get his brother to do it because, oh. because his David is currently, he just procrastinated. Oh, procrastination can be a thing. Yeah. Well, that'll probably come up in another story. We'll wait for that one to come in. It could be next week. Yeah. Yeah. We'll try and we'll see what comes up. So will we say a little bit of a prayer and then we'll do the family prayer? Yeah, okay. Closing our eyes, you ready? You've got two together, that's an extra noise. Okay, so dear God, thank you for all the lovely things that you've given us and the wonderful things like friends and people who help us and beautiful things like music and dancing, which we can use to show how much we love you and how much we want to praise you kind of like we do with our children's song, when we sing and we do all the actions. Please help us to remember that sometimes we might be disappointed when we're not able to do things, but let us always try and remember that you have a plan, and if we can't do something straight away, there's going to be a really good reason for it. We just have to wait and see what it is. Okay? And now we're going to say our family player. Thank you. All together. So, our Father in heaven... Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Okay, thank you very much for the great listening. We're going to do your song in action just now, and I think it's coming home to you. Yeah, so we'll get ready for that. I might take these ones away. It might get quite loud during it. Bring them back through the house. Yeah, thank you. Show what
pray together. Loving God, as we come to consider your word, we pray that you will, that you will open our hearts to, to know your presence in our lives, that you will open our minds so that we can receive what it is that you want to say to us this morning. May we put the outside distractions away for these few precious moments to hear from you. So loving God, Holy Spirit, come rest in this place. Be tangible in this place as we worship, as we think on what it is that you want to say to us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so this morning I want to show you a different way of understanding the concept of a half. Normally, when you have two parts of something, when you have two parts of, of a thing uh, and you split them in half, then you have two halves and you put them back together again, you get one whole thing. This is not a new concept to you. Anybody who has been through uh, primary two or three maths will know the concept of uh, halves and wholes. But I want to give you a, a, a deeper way of understanding the concept of halves or the concept of, of two different parts of an object. So I'm going to give you a, a couple of examples um, for that. In the third season of the US uh, TV sitcom Friends, there is uh, an episode where Ross, one of the characters in Friends, is trying to encourage his friends to leave their apartment, to go to an event that they have to, uh, that they have to go to. Over the course of the episode, there are various scenarios that take place and various things that happen that prevent them from leaving or, 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 um, or stop them uh, from leaving as soon as they would want. In one scenario, there are two characters, Joy and Chandler, who are arguing over who gets to sit in one particular chair in the apartment. And the results of this are, uh, we'll show you up on the screen, hopefully, um, we'll give you the clip that shows you that. All right, you will notice that I am fully dressed. I, in turn, have noticed that you are not. So, in the words of A.A. A. Milne, get out of my chair. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> what are you doing? Well, you said I had to give you the chair. You didn't see anything about the cushions. <laughs> the cushions are the essence of the chair. That's right. I'm taking the essence. <laughs> oh, he'll be back. Oh, there's nobody in the room. <laughs> the cushions are the essence of the chair. The physical aspect of the chair is there, and the essence of the chair is represented by the cushions. I'll give you another example. Here is the Girls' Brigade flag. Um, it is a Union flag, as you can see. The flag is made of cloth. It's made of colored dye. In the past, somebody somewhere uh, decided that this was the design of a flag, this was what a flag uh, or the Union flag should look like. That's the physical aspect of the flag. But inextricably linked to it is another dimension. The dimension that says something about what it means to be part of Girls' Brigade or Boys' Brigade, or what it means to be British, what it means to be part of a country, and what that means there is a physical aspect to the flag but there is a deeper meaning to what the flag stands for what the flag represents let me give you another example there are two parts to it one physical and one sort of mysterious or ethereal two dimensions of the whole here's another example What I have here is a delightful, glorious object of great wonder. It is made up of cocoa powder, 
sugar, butter. I have the wrong glasses on to read this properly. <laughs> Cocoa powder, sugar, milk, cream, all of those kinds of, kinds of things. That's the physical part of the glorious chocolate bar. This chocolate bar also uh, promotes anti-slavery, so there's a sort of other bit of it as well. But there is another part of the chocolate bar. There is the flavor in the chocolate bar. There is the joy or the guilt of eating the chocolate bar. There is the feelings that it gives you. There are two dimensions to the whole, not just the physical, but the mysterious and the ethereal. There are two dimensions to the whole thing, two halves of the whole. And grasping that notion that there are different ways of seeing two things or two halves of something all wrapped together, the physical and the mysterious or the ethereal, getting that idea of those two things being wrapped together is key to understanding one of the most fundamental and almost universally misunderstood elements of the Christian faith. And this notion is really vividly illustrated in the last time that Jesus spends with his disciples on earth. As Jesus leaves his disciples, something happens that illustrates this. Remember, if you were here last week, you remember me talking about the fact that Jesus said to his disciples that he was going to leave them, that, um, that he would send uh, something back to be with them, a counselor, an advocate, a helper. And we call that thing the paraclete, uh, which is just a kind of fancy name for helper, comforter, counselor. It means all of those things. Well, this is the point that Jesus is leaving his disciples, but before the point that that counselor helper, advocate, comforter comes back before the paraclete comes back. And as we witness Jesus leaving his disciples, we get an illustration of something happening that scores of Christians have misunderstood throughout the centuries. And Doug is going to come up and read that for us just now. Acts uh, chapter 1, reading from verse 6. Then they gathered round him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, <clears throat> he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. <clears throat> men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Amen. Thank you, Doug, and thank you for giving us time to look up the reading um, for ourselves. Week after week across the country, many uh, ministers at various points in the week, be it um, on a Monday morning in their study or a Wednesday afternoon in a coffee shop or um, some of them, I'm sure, on a Saturday night um, in bed or at three o'clock in the morning by candlelight, are trying to make heads or tails of a passage of Scripture. And 
trying to work out a way to explain it to their congregations in what is known as a sermon. Research would say that that, um, that, that time is pretty much wasted uh, because congregations aren't learning about God through sermons. They're not learning about God that way. It seems that most people get their understanding of God and their theology through hymns. In a, in a book that I have on my bookshelves that's written by one of my former lecturers at university, a guy called Ian Bradley, who is a practical theologian, a minister, and writer and broadcaster, he, um, he writes this. He says, more people, I suspect, would be able to quote the first line of a hymn than a verse from the Bible or from a prayer. And you could probably add sermon into there. The U.S. writer of many, many hymns, hymns like To God Be the Glory and The Old Rugged Cross and Blessed Assurance, a lady called Fanny Crosby once wrote this little line of verse. She said, I think that life is not too long, and therefore I determine that many people read a song who will not read a sermon. There is it puts a great amount of responsibility for our theological education, for our, under, for, for, for our way of understanding God into the hands of songwriters and song choosers, many of whom don't have any theological education whatsoever. And probably and possibly, and a lot of the time, we get, they get that theology incorrect. They get theology wrong. For example, here is one example of some dodgy theology in one of the most famous hymns, and we sing it every single year. The hymn, Away in a Manger, says this in verse 2. It says, The cattle are lowing, the baby awakes, but little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. There is no evidence in Scripture to say that, that the baby Jesus never cried. There is no evidence in Scripture to say that maybe Jesus did cry. The writers of the Gospels didn't think it was important whether Jesus cried or not. They assumed that he was a normal baby. But in our humanity and in our common sense, we would say that if a baby didn't cry, then we would be calling the midwife. We would get a doctor in because that's absurd and incorrect. There's something dodgy in what it is that we sing. But as the verse goes on, there's some more slightly dodgy theology. So the next verse says, I love you, Lord Jesus, look down from the sky and stay by my side until morning is nigh. The notion here is that Jesus is up there in heaven, that that's where heaven is, and that's what happens when we die. But that's not how the Bible describes heaven. It's not how the Bible describes heaven. And this kind of theology is reinforced by many other hymns. There's a hymn by Henry Moore, which was in the previous uh, uh, hymnology, hymn, hymn, hymnary that we, uh, uh, that we have called CH3. It says, God has ascended up on high with merry noise of trumpet sound, and princely seated in the sky rules over all the earth around. It's not quite what the Bible says, or not in the face of it, that's not really what the Bible says about where Jesus is. It's kind of correct, and I'll come on to explain why it's kind of correct, um, or you'll get why it's kind of correct later, but, but it gives us a sort of slightly um, wrong-ish impression of where that is. The hymn that we always have to sing on Easter Sunday also has a slightly dodgy line in it, where it says... And the, at the end of it, uh, um, the hymn, Thine Be the Glory, says, Bring us safe through Jordan to thy home above. It's not actually how Scripture understands where heaven is. Even our closing hymn this morning, you'll see this when we get to the end of the service, even our closing hymn today slides some slightly dodgy theology in when it says, priestly king and throne forever, high in heaven above. It's not entirely wrong, but it gives us a sort of slightly wrong emphasis and a slightly wrong uh, uh, impression. The problem is that, they, uh, that all of these kinds of hymns 
reinforce the view that heaven is up there and we are down here. And that's not how Scripture describes where heaven and earth are. The way that heaven and earth are described in Scripture is that heaven, and I'm not going to point up there, that heaven is God's space and that earth is our space. Heaven is God's space and earth is our space. And eventually, the two parts will come together. If you read the book of Revelation, if you get to the end of the book of Revelation in chapter 21, it says that these two things come together. The point is, heaven is not someplace up in the sky. It is not a physical place located within our cosmos, within our time, and it is certainly not our home, our permanent home when we die. That's not how Scripture describes where heaven is. Now, it's far too much for me to explain all the ins and outs of what that actually is in today's sermon, but I can point you towards a podcast that will tell you um, some of that stuff. One part of one of the podcasts I listened to to do with this was a conversation between two theologians. And in the conversation, one of them asked the question, isn't there some sort of non-material part of me that survives death? And the writer and theologian, Dr. Tim Mackey, responded, responds saying this. He says, the biblical authors refuse to speculate about what happens after death, only that the authors say we are with the Lord. The biblical authors are clear that Jesus never leaves us or abandons us. Jesus has not left or, left or abandoned anybody that we love who has died. That's not how Scripture describes it. Scripture is clear Je Jesus never leaves us or abandons us. That's what Jesus said last week. Scripture says that there is life after death. The resurrection shows that there is life after death. Jesus came through death to life. That's the whole purpose of the resurrection. But it's not clouds and harps and, and angels up in the sky. So you need to push all of that that you probably have held on to since Sunday school. You need to push all of that out of your head and put it in a bin and don't look at it again. That's not what Scripture says. Push all of that aside about heaven being our permanent home in the end. The relationship between heaven and earth is much more rich. It is much more like the relationship between a flag and its meaning, or a chocolate bar and the flavor of it, or perhaps a chair and its cushions, but less physical um, than that. The concept of heaven and earth is much more interwoven and much more closer to our world than that. And so in the light of that understanding, in the light of pushing all of that stuff aside, let's read a key sentence in the passage that Doug just read to us. It says, after he said this, he was taken up before their eyes and a cloud hid them from their sight. Now, it's easy to see how we would get to the point of saying, well, heaven must be up there because Jesus was taken up before their eyes. But taken up in this passage of Scripture doesn't mean going up to a geographical location. Doesn't mean going up to a geographical location. Tim Mackey explains this again. He goes on. He says, when the ancient Hebrew writers talk about geographic locations and spatial relationships in the physical world, they often use these physical descriptions to represent a higher transcendent reality. For example, death and emptiness, he says, are down under in what they call Sheol, which is the, um, uh, the Hebrew word for, for hell. And because God is transcendent or above, then his space is metaphorically described as being above or up. Not actually, metaphorically. So in Luke, so Luke, the writer of Acts that we, that we just read, when he says that Jesus was taken up, he's not thinking physically. He is thinking that Jesus moved to a higher reality, to God's space. 
And this notion is underlined by the physical presence of a cloud, because clouds represent God's presence. Back in Exodus, in the story of the Exodus, after they go through the Red Sea and all that kind of, kind of stuff that you can read back in the book of Exodus, the Israelites are led by God's presence, and God's presence is a cloud. That by day, God's presence is a pillar of cloud. If we read on in Acts, then Luke describes the scene where the disciples are looking intently up into the sky, uh, looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking up at the sky? Two angels appear, they look at the disciples, and they basically say, why are you looking in the sky? That's not where Jesus is. He isn't there. He's all around you. Why are you looking up there for Jesus? That's not where he is. And as we'll learn next week, Jesus is all around us. The Holy Spirit, the paraclete, the thing that Jesus sends back to us the pers is the personal presence of Jesus. The relationship between heaven and earth in Scripture is so much closer, so much richer, so much more interwoven into our world and into our life than a traditional Sunday school understanding of heaven up there, high in the sky, uh, clouds and harps. It's less heaven up there removed from our daily lives and more like this. It's more like the difference between the words that we use to communicate and the feeling we get from a good conversation. It's more like the difference between the pigments and the liquids and the chemicals smeared on a stretched piece of canvas and the awe and wonder that we feel when we look at a great piece of art. It's more like heaven and earth are more like the difference between a combination of wires and hammers and wood and the beautiful, glorious music that a piano can play. And if you think back through your life, then you have got more, much more experience of encountering heaven in your life like that than some remote thing that happens away up there. There's an ancient Celtic saying that says, heaven and earth are only three feet apart. And it goes on to say, in thin places, that distance is much shorter. The phrase thin places has been used by Celtic Christianity for centuries. It's used to describe those places where we feel heaven and earth overlapping. In an article that was written in the New York Times in 2012, the travel writer Eric Weiner says this. He says, they are locales where the distance between heaven and earth collapses and we're able to catch glimpses of the divine or the transcendent. Even the New York Times gets that heaven and earth are different from how we've understood them. And as you think back over your life, whether your life has been long or short, you'll know what those thin places are for you. Places where there was something extra, something ethereal, something blessed, something transcendent, something holy. I think actually that we have thin places. I think we have thin times and thin experiences as well. So it's times when a piece of music moved you, when a conversation brought you closer to another person, a time when you were filled with the Holy Spirit, when something in a glorious moment sunk into your very soul. That's when we become witnesses to heaven and when heaven becomes so near that we can touch it. This is where Jesus is. He is exalted. He is the sustainer of the universe. He reigns at the right hand of the Father and he holds the universe together, but not in some far off, uh, not in some far off actual literal place, but in heaven, a place that exists so close that it's as if it's the mysterious second half 
of the air. Okay, breathe. Breathe with me. And then let it out. It's a lot to take in. I understand that. I want to tell you one more thing. I want to give you one more example which will bring this round to what it is that we're about to do next. There's one last example that I want to give you in understanding how heaven and earth work and to tell you about before I finish. In our lives as churchgoers, we can come to church, we can sing the hymns, we can play the instruments, we can make the tea and coffee, we can visit the housebound and bereaved, we can deliver the flowers, we can stand up and recite all the right words at baptisms, and we can take bread and wine at communion, and we might even be able to say the words, Jesus died for me, and therefore I'm forgiven. These are all lovely, great things to do. But if they're just things we do, then we're just earth churchgoers. We're a bit one-dimensional. When we truly open ourselves up to God, when we truly open ourselves up to the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, when we truly take on board that Jesus actually, 2,000 years ago, died on a cross for you, for you, for you, and for me, and for every person that you meet, to forgive us, to wipe our slate, slate clean, to conquer death and sin, when we take that, actually take that on board and live our lives in response to that, then we become Christians, ones who have Christ. We become Christians, ones who have Christ living in us. That's when we become two-dimensional Christians. That's when we become heaven-aware Christians. That's when we have the Holy Spirit living inside us, and that completely changes how we live our lives. In a moment, as you can see, we're going to do something weird. We're going to celebrate a sacrament. In the Church of Scotland, we have two sacraments. We, have, we only recognize two sacraments, baptism and holy communion. If nothing else is a sacrament according to the Church of Scotland. So, what we're about to do is one of the two most important things that you can do as a Christian. So, what we're about to do is really important to our life of faith. But again, the sacrament represents and illustrates the relationship between heaven and earth. These parts of the sacrament, these things, these ordinary, normal things, this, and just so you know, non-alcoholic wine and gluten-free bread, these normal things of the world are a reminder of, an actual reminder of the things of heaven. It's an actual reminder of Jesus' last meal on the earth with his disciples. It's an actual reminder of Jesus' blood that was poured out on the cross for us and of his body that was broken on the cross for us. It's an actual reminder of that sacrifice. And it's been done for 2,000 years. We are part of that legacy. It's a powerful, powerful thing that we're about to do. The things of earth in this thin moment of sacrament become the things of heaven for us. In the liturgy that I'll read and that will join in, we'll, you'll, you'll get a sense of that. The things of earth become the things of heaven in this sacrament. This is the story that we are called to tell. The, the heaven and earth are woven into the very fabric of our lives. This is the story of forgiveness of closeness, of recognizing God's voice in our lives, of part of being a dynamic community, and of heaven and earth being together and coming together. May your life be a witness to that. May our church be a witness to that. May my life be a witness to that, so that heaven becomes the second half of the earth, so close that it's interwoven into everything we do. So of heaven and earth so close that you can actually touch it. Let's pray together. 
Loving God, we thank you that you are not removed from us, that you are not remote from us, that you are so close that we can experience you in our lives. Pray that you bring to mind those moments when you have been that close to us. And in this sacrament that we are about to receive, may that open us up to you. May we feel that heaven is so close to us that that's where you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So before we take uh, the sacrament um, of communion of bread and wine, we're going to sing together. We're going to sing the hymn for everyone born at a place at the table.
Welcome everyone who wants to. Come if you can recite the creeds. Come if you can't remember the words to Jesus loves me. Come if you've been in church since birth. Come if you've lost your way a few times, but found your way here today. Come if you like to study theology. Come if you like to finger paint. Come if you like tradition and ritual and ceremony. Come if you like balloons and laughter and jumping in puddles. Come if you like all of these things and find the wonder of heaven in them all. Come as you are young and old. Come as you are one family right now, each of you, every one of you, and have a seat right here. It looks like bread, and it is bread, but God is incredibly imaginative. There is a surprise in this bread, for within it, each crumb, God has folded nothing less than heaven. And when we break it, and everyone has a piece, what we are doing is saying, let's share the story of Jesus together. It looks like a goblet of wine, and it is wine. But God being God didn't leave it there. He has squeezed into every drop a promise of the whole world. And when we pass it among us, and everyone has a taste, it sort of whispers to our souls, and sort of tangles with our memories, telling us God loves us. God loves us. God loves us completely. So let's break bread and listen to the story and share wine and hear the promise. One night, Jesus and the disciples were sitting in a room, and the meal table was spread before them. There was lamb and herbs and bread, and soon they had all had their fill. They were talking to each other about the days and the months that had passed. One of the disciples, Peter, was telling them about how he felt when he stepped out of that boat in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. Do you remember that? And he wanted to walk towards Jesus over the surface and what it felt like when the water reached his knees and when it reached his middle and when it reached his neck. Matthew was talking about the time before he was a disciple sitting in the sun, counting out taxpayers' money, enjoying the chink, chink, chink of the coins. Does anybody remember that story? When a shadow blocked the sun and he lost count. He looked up and he saw the silhouette of Jesus that had filled his view and asked him to put down the money and to follow him. And Andrew interrupted Matthew to tell him about the time, the time when he found a wee boy with two fish and five barley loaves. Maybe we remember that one. Hardly enough for a full meal. And he presented the boy and his basket to Jesus in front of a huge crowd of 500 people. You could hear the laughter from the front few rows at the thought of feeding them all with a 12-year-old's packed lunch. But he did. And all the other disciples told their memories of what, what had happened to them while they were following Jesus. And eventually Jesus interrupted them and he said, here's another story. And he lifted the bread lying on the table. And he paused and everyone fell silent. And he said, this bread is the most important reminder you have of me. More than all these stories, this bread is an image of my body I break it to show you that my own body will break. I want you all to break this bread so that you all know what's happening to me. And I want you to do it regularly, reminding yourselves of me each time and what I have done for you, dying because I love you so much. All the disciples were speechless as Jesus passed the broken bread around. They didn't understand in the same way that none of us really truly understand. And while it was being passed around, 
Jesus lifted up a goblin and held it there in front of them in midair for a moment, and everyone fell silent again. This wine, he said, is another reminder of me, but it is a symbol of my blood and will be spilled when I die. But don't be afraid, because tucked within it is a promise, a covenant, that I will be with you always wherever you go, and I will never let you go. Friends, I love you so, so much, even death cannot separate us. And again, Jesus passed the wine around them all. They all took a sip, and none of them really understood, as with all honesty, none of us could say today that we really truly understand. And today we share the very same meal that Jesus did with his friends. The bread and the wine are a reminder of the stories of Jesus and what he did for us because he loves us so much. This bread is my body, Jesus says. Eat of it, all of you. This wine is my blood, and within it is a promise drink of it, all of you. So, if you're able, then I invite you to come forward to receive the bread and to receive the wine. The table is open for all who love Jesus and want to love Him more.
lost you have been found All that labeled right or wrong To everyone who hears this song He said come to the table Come join the sinners who have been Jesus had risen from the dead, he stood amongst his friends, his disciples, and he said, peace be with you. If you're comfortable doing so, then I, offer, I invite you to show a sign of peace to those around you. Ron's going to come up and lead us in our prayers for others. On a recent holiday, we saw the following on the notice board of a local church. Carpenter from Nazareth seeks joiner. Life is fragile, handle with prayer. So let's all be joiners and join together in prayer. God of power, may the boldness of your spirit transform us. May the gentleness of your spirit lead us. May the gifts of your spirit be our goal and our strength now and always. Gracious God, you keep your promises. This day we receive the spirit of which Jesus spoke in bread and in wine, and we rejoice that now and forever this world is filled with your presence. Lord, we feel your presence in everything we see in this world. As we look around now, we see the new life springing up in the green trees, the fresh grass, the new flowers, early growth in crops, and the new life in lambs and other animals. Father, we are so grateful that we can appreciate all that you have given us. Life is fragile. Handle with care. Lord, we pray for all those who find life very fragile, the elderly, those who don't know where to go for safety, shelter from bombs and other danger, where to go for food and sustenance that we all enjoy without giving too much thought about where it comes from. Life is fragile. Handle with care. Bread and wine reminds us of your son's sacrifice for us. The cost is life. Father, we pray for our young folk who may be in the middle of exams or who have completed them and await a result. Be with them and let them know that whatever the result, they are loved and cherished. We remember at this time those who have sacrificed everything for others. We thank you for the lives and the freedoms that sacrifice has given us. We pray for those who continue to sacrifice themselves in the giving time and talents and skills without fear or favor. Doctors, nurses, medics, volunteers, working in zones of danger, places ravaged by storms, floods, and other natural disasters. We pray for all those affected by disease, lack of vital facilities, water, food, shelter. Enable our world to share the vast resources it has to aid those in need. Life is fragile. Handle with care. As always, we pray for all those in our own community, those in financial need, spiritual need, need of healthy sustenance, those with addictions, the lost, and the lonely. Show them your love and mercy with the knowledge that you are always there listening, watching, 
loving. Along with your disciples, we don't always understand about Jesus' ascent to heaven and why it happened and the Holy Spirit given to your chosen ones. We pray that your Holy Spirit continues to inspire and guide us in all we do. Let us be the joiners. Join us in work for others. Join us in giving to others. Join us in love for the unloved. Join us in prayers for others. Come, O Holy Spirit, come as holy fire and burn in us. Come as a holy wind and cleanse us within. Come, holy light, and lead us in darkness. Amen. Thank you, Ron. There's uh, an opportunity at the end of the service to uh, stick around for tea and coffee and any of the other goodies that, uh, that we've got uh, uh, for you. Um, and please stick around to have a chat if you're able uh, uh, to stick around. Um, there's um, Over on this side, there's the sign-up sheets for various things. There's the stuff for your welcome cards um, and, uh, and any of the, the save-a-loaf stuff where we're trying to not uh, we're trying to save things from going into uh, food waste is over on that side as well so you can uh, check that out as well and somebody will be hanging around there for that um, there's also the the card machine if you want uh, to donate to christian aid if you've not got that folding money with you um, then uh, then the card machine is over there for that too um, so let's Stand together if you're able as we sing together our final hymn, hymn 436, Christ triumphant, ever reigning. And when that line comes on, don't think about, God, about Jesus up there. Think about him on a higher plane in heaven um, surrounding us. Let's stand together to sing Christ triumphant, ever reigning.
And so in the power of the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit, in, this, in the knowledge of the sacrament we just partook in, go out into our world to tell the story of Jesus crucified and risen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and all those you love and all those you find it more difficult to love this day and forevermore. Yeah.